Economists cannot be free from value judgment, especially political value judgments. There are at least five reasons why this is the case. Well, the first reason is that economics is in large part about government economic policy. It may be positive about it, it may be negative about it. You know, there's uh, even within neoclassical economics, uh, there's uh, the market failure approach, which says real world markets uh, often fail to produce the result expected in economic theory of perfect competition because of monopolies, because of externalities, because of public goods, and there are good reasons to intervene you know, for the government to bring individual cost-benefit structure in line with social cost-benefit structure. Within the neoclassical school, there's also the government failure approach, corruption, inefficiency, you know, bureaucracy. You know. So, I mean, uh, you may be positive or negative about uh, government intervention, but uh, the point is that a lot of economics is actually about government policy. Yeah? Even the idea of laissez-faire, that is a policy. Yeah? Doing nothing doesn't actually mean literally not doing anything. Yeah? It uh, supports a particular type of uh, government uh, policy. Yeah? The analysis of government policy within the neoclassical economics has developed uh, much further. Because uh, in the beginning, uh, they said that uh, we are renaming the subject to get rid of uh, the, uh, politics. But then, barely one generation after, along came Arthur Pigou, then professor at uh, University of Cambridge, with this idea of externality. And from there, developed a whole range of analysis called the market failure approach. Eh? Now, frankly, if you apply this approach at, at, uh, to is a logical limit, there'll be very few areas where you cannot have uh, government uh, intervention yeah? because markets fail all the time. Yeah? And then despite this uh, pretension that we are getting out of politics, the subject actually has uh, developed far more tools uh, to analyze, uh, analyze uh, the policies and politics. Yeah? Politics can uh, influence the way economic research is done. Yeah? So, for example, in the old days, under socialism, the government uh, basically banned research on bourgeois neoclassical economics, yeah? unless it is done to criticize it. Yeah? But it's uh, not just the socialists, you know, the many the right-wing dictatorships used to ban the, the study of Marxist economics. Yeah? I grew up under a military dictatorship in South Korea in the 1970s and 80s, and it was illegal to be in possession of uh, books by, for example, Karl Marx. Yeah? You could go to prison for that. Yeah? It could be a bit more subtle than that. I mean, in the 1950s and 60s, under so-called McCarthyism in the United States, you had systematic persecution of uh, Marxist economists uh, in universities. Yeah? Secondly, economically powerful people can and have uh, influenced uh, economic research uh, through funding. Yeah? You know, there are many pro-free market think tanks like Institute of uh, Economic Affairs in this country or the Heritage Foundation and Cato Institute in America that have been funded by the rich people to generate research uh, that uh, justify free market approach. Even when there's no direct pressure on the economics uh, profession to study particular types of uh, economics, what is the main topic of research is very heavily influenced by the politics of the day. So right after the Second World War, full employment was on the top of research agenda for most economists. Because that's when the society was reformed after the Great Depression and the Second World War, and the working class power rose with increasing unionization, coming to power of uh, social democratic parties in many countries. Yeah, so full employment, which was the concern for the uh, workers, was at the top of research agenda. Since the 1980s, with the rise of uh, so-called neoliberalism, a double act that, for better or worse, changed the world. Realignment of politics in many countries. Full employment has uh, basically more or less uh, disappeared from the research agenda of economists. Yeah? 
inequality, which was supposed to be a non-issue until, say, 2005, 6, 7, is uh, suddenly coming back as a popular item in research agenda for economists because now there's a growing concern that the gap between the super rich and the rest is uh, widening and this uh, increasing gap is even negatively influencing things like uh, democracy and civic rights and so on. So, you know, there's uh, the now much greater concern about inequality. So we've already seen three ways in which uh, politics can influence economics, but uh, there's also causality in the other direction. Because uh, economic theory actually affects the way the government, not just the economy, is organized. So in the socialist countries in the past, you had this uh, Marxist theory that says the best way to organize the economy is to plan it centrally. Now, in order to do that, you basically have to create a huge government apparatus. You cannot just have one kind of central planning bureau kind of issuing projections and estimates, no. You need yeah, Ministry of Textile, Ministry of uh, the, the Light Consumer Goods, uh, you need the Ministry of Coal, you know. In the capitalist countries in the last few decades, especially in the US, uh, UK, Australia, New Zealand, influenced by the government failure approach, many countries have reorganized their government. Yeah? Because the, the government failure approach recommends that you should uh, shrink the size of the, the state to the minimum, but also introduce a lot of uh, market principles. So these countries have uh, privatized their state-owned enterprises. You know, the UK used to have uh, one of the biggest uh, state-owned enterprise sector in the world. You know? Not anymore. You know? I mean, a lot of government activities have been outsourced. You know? So in this country, you have a lot of uh, the, the apparently public agencies which uh, basically provide public services uh, by contracting these out to private providers. Eh? These are not government services in the traditional sense anymore. Eh? You can see how powerful the influence of economic theories can be on the organization of the government as well as uh, the economy. Eh? The third reason why economics is intertwined with politics is that uh, all economic theories contain political value judgments. Many of the differences between different economic schools are due to their different views on economic things, like how technology is evolved, you know? how market competition works. You know? They all have different theories, but there are uh, many differences that uh, fundamentally come from differences in political value judgments. You know? Now, sometimes these uh, political differences are embodied in what look like a technical difference. Eh? The best example is uh, the Pareto criterion that is a central principle within neoclassical economics. Now, what is a Pareto criterion? Pareto criterion says that you cannot call a social change an improvement if it makes even a single person worse off. Now, in the beginning, when the neoclassical economics uh, that uh, emerged out of uh, classical economics in the late 19th century, neoclassical economics also subscribed to this idea of utilitarianism. You, know, you have heard of this, uh, Jeremy Bentham, the greatest happiness of the greatest majority. In the early 20th century, Wilfredo Pareto, this half Italian, half French economist who taught in Switzerland, some of his followers came up and said, no, actually that is not acceptable. Yeah? If you run the society in that kind of way, it means that uh, you can demand sacrifice by a minority for the greater good. Yeah? Let me uh, give you a, a more intuitive explanation with uh, what I call the one finger story. Yeah? Tomorrow morning, someone knocks at my door, Oh, Dr. Chang, we found this uh, marvelous technology that will solve the climate change problem overnight. And I say, oh, great. Uh, that, uh, what is it? Well, 
never mind the details, but uh, the, we came to you to ask for help. Well, I'm only an economist. I don't know anything about science. No, no, you can help. What is it? Oh, this machine has already been built. It's all primed up, ready to go, but we need one little input, which we want you to have the honor of providing. So I say, what is it? Well, we need one live human finger to start this machine. Yeah, well, even before they finish the sentence, I run into my kitchen, cut my little finger off, and give it to them. Well, what is one finger compared to the whole world? Well, what if it's uh, one arm? Yeah, of course I'll do it. What if it's my life? Maybe. Yeah. What if it's a life of my family? What if it's a life of uh, 50 million South Koreans? Yeah? Or 70 million North and South Koreans? Yeah? This is a problem with this uh, utilitarian thinking. Yeah? Because, uh, yeah, you can always uh, say, well, you can make a little concession. Yeah? And then where do you stop? Where do you draw the line? Before you know it, it uh, you are in the same bed with uh, Stalin and Hitler. Yeah? The greater good. Yeah? Yeah, so the Pareto was uh, making a very powerful ethical point. Yeah? You just cannot sacrifice individuals for the greater good. Yeah? So what it is saying is also that you cannot touch the status quo. Yeah? You, know, you might have a very the, the unequal country, and someone might propose, oh yeah, if we raise uh, taxes uh, for the rich uh, by this much and redistribute it uh, to the poorest people, we can reduce poverty by this much, we can reduce uh, inequality by this much, but if uh, the, the people who are going to be taxed say no, you cannot do it if you believed in Pareto principle. Yeah? Yeah, so one person can veto the whole thing. Yeah? Now, I'm not saying that there's an easy answer to this. Yeah? In between absolute defense of the status quo and this uh, the, the tyranny of the majority, but uh, what I can with certainty tell you is that Pareto criterion is a very political position. In this context, uh, my favorite quote comes from this uh, Brazilian bishop called Dom Helder Camara, who was one of the leaders of the uh, so-called liberation theology, which was uh, this uh, radical Catholic uh, theology that was popular in Latin America in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. I mean, some of the more extreme members actually advocated even armed struggle. And he once uh, famously said, when I give food to poor people, they call me a saint. When I ask why they have not enough to eat, they call me a communist. Yeah? No, I think as a uh, trained social scientist, we should all become a bit of a communist. Yeah? No, you should uh, always question the underlying social order that is uh, creating this problem. Yeah? The limitations of uh, Pareto criterion is that it doesn't ask that question. Hmm? It accepts uh, the existing distribution of income and power, and then say, well, what if we do this? Is anyone, get that, 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 uh, is anyone going to get hurt? Hmm? So when you have things like that sitting in the very middle of neoclassical economic theory, how can you say that it is an apolitical hmm, scientific understanding of the world. Power is uh, something that is uh, very understudied in economics. Even political scientists uh, whose uh, central interest is uh, the power don't seem to be uh, able to agree on a single uh, definition. Within the dominant uh, economic approach, uh, that is uh, the neoclassical school, there's only one kind of power, which is uh, called market power. This is when someone has a monopoly or a few firms have oligopoly, or someone has a monopsony, which is the dominant position as a buyer. So there is that power, market power, within neoclassical economics. But other than that, power is not there. But even when there is no market power, there are at least three other forms of power that matter in our understanding of the economy. Well, many. Neoclassical economists see the competitive market as a place devoid of power relationships because market exchanges are voluntary. So under feudalism in Europe, the lord of the manor would demand that their serfs work, say, 
three out of five days at, uh, in their field, yeah? rather than the Serbs' uh, own field. Yeah? Under the central planning system, the central planning authority would decide that, well, next year we are going to uh, produce only black shoes, yeah? no pattern shoes. Yeah? So they have to buy them. Yeah? But within free market, there is no such uh, authority. Yeah? So people make uh, the, these uh, voluntary exchanges, and the thinking is, well, if it is uh, not to their benefit, no one will go into these contracts. Eh? So for example, if uh, there, there's uh, a poor person in India, say, signing up to work in this uh, factory that uh, involves uh, toxic chemicals, which he knows is uh, likely to make him sick in the next few years, and probably going to kill him in the next 10-15 uh, years. If he signs up to this job, knowing this, neoclassical economists say, no problem. Hmm? Yeah, the guy has made a calculation. Yeah? But this interpretation ignores the fact that people with little independent means of uh, income and wealth voluntarily do unpleasant things, dangerous things, things that are even sure to kill them in due course because they have no alternative. Karl Marx had uh, made a sort of career out of <laughs> emphasizing this uh, point, but even Adam Smith, I mean, uh, in his book, The Wealth of Nations, there's this passage where he explicitly says that, well, basically workers have to accept whatever wages uh, that are offered to them by the capitalists because they are not going to last even a week uh, without working. In contrast, most capitalists can live very happily without employing any worker for a couple of years eh? because they have money. Eh? I mean, of course, uh, they want to make more money, so they, that's why they are running factories where if the worst comes to worst, okay, forget about that uh, employing people. Eh? At least in the rich uh, the capitalist countries, this imbalance uh, the, compared to the, the days of uh, Adam Smith or Karl Marx has uh, the shrunk uh, quite a lot because the workers have uh, the welfare state. Yeah? They have uh, trade unions uh, that uh, provide uh, some, say, means of subsistence if uh, the, they go on a strike and so on. Yeah? But the imbalance is still there. Yeah? And it might be actually increasing yeah? because of the increasing uh, income inequality, the shrinkage in the welfare state, in many, although not all, uh, advanced capitalist economies, the weakening of trade unions, and the rise of the so-called gig economy, in which workers are bogusly classified as independent suppliers and deprived of uh, the workers' rights uh, that are uh, uh, constituted uh, in the laws. Yeah? The second type of power is what I call the power to dictate things within organizations. What do I mean by that? You know, Herbert Simon, the father of the behavioralist uh, school, whom in one of my earlier books uh, I called the last Renaissance man because he was originally trained as a political scientist, but then became one of the founding fathers of uh, the artificial intelligence and also studied psychology, management, and economics. In that article, he observed that, well, if you invited a Martian or some you know, alien being to come and watch the Earth economy, how would it describe the Earth economy? Would they call it a market economy? Never. Because in his reckoning, something like 80% of economic decisions are made within organizations, like companies, governments, yeah? cooperatives. Yeah? He was pointing to our neglect of this vast area of the economy, which does not work according to market principle. Yeah? So within these organizations, basically, there's a hierarchical power-based relationship. Yeah? If you are a guy lower down the hierarchical chain, Basically, you will do what your superior tells you. Yeah? There's no bargaining. Yeah? 
given that this uh, the kind of relationship covers basically 80% of the economy, or at least a vast majority, not understanding this uh, power relationship means that we are understanding only a smaller part of the economy. The third, the power to make people think uh, what you want them to think. You know, at the deepest level, this is the most important power. Yeah? If you can do that, you don't need police, you don't need army, yeah? you don't need prison. Yeah? People will do what you want. Yeah? The most obvious example is advertising. Yeah? yeah, advertising provides you with certain information and influences your choice given your preferences but it often goes deeper. Yeah? It actually changes your preferences. Yeah? Yeah, this is why the, the advertisers uh, love to use uh, celebrities and you know, sports uh, stars. Yeah? Because somehow people then get to associate that, that this product with a high life, yeah? high achievement. Yeah? People with uh, money have and still do influence other people so that they acquire worldviews that are fundamentally against their own interests, but are good for defending the status quo. Karl Marx used to call this false consciousness. So given your objective interest, as a, I don't know, the struggling blue collar worker in Midwest in the United States, why would you vote for someone like uh, Donald Trump? Hmm? So people said that these people have false consciousness. It's, uh, the yeah, kind of a, a false idea. Well, these days uh, we call this the matrix. And there are numerous examples of false consciousness in history. Yeah? So many slaves are the, in the US, in Brazil, in the old days, you know, they help uh, their masters to oppress other slaves yeah? because they believed that this was the right social order. Yeah? And how dare this uh, the young guy that uh, tried to break out of uh, this order ordained by God. Yeah? The scenes uh, we have seen after the uh, introduction of the so-called Obamacare, the health care reform that uh, Barack Obama was uh, trying to introduce into the, the United States, you know, these old people saying, keep government out of my Medicare. Hello, Medicare is a government program. Huh? But these people have been so brainwashed by the American health insurance industry that government healthcare programs never work, they couldn't imagine that this nice little program that is helping them in their old age to cope with uh, disease and uh, other problems called Medicare is a government program. Huh? So understanding this uh, the issue of false consciousness or the matrix is uh, crucial in understanding economics. Hmm? You know, most economists believe that politics is an irrational force that interferes with the rational workings of the market. Hmm? We've seen this in this country in the run-up to the so-called Brexit uh, referendum. Hmm? You know, economists were coming out in great forces, you know, arguing that uh, this is going to destroy the economy. I mean. I'm not disputing whether they were right or wrong, but and then when the people didn't vote uh, the way they thought that uh, they should, they started complaining, ah, this is why the democracy is uh, bad for economic management. You know? People don't understand these things. Yeah? When people say things like this, you know, the politics is an irrational force yeah? impinging on the, the rationality of the market and so on, what they are implicitly assuming is that there's a clearly scientifically definable boundary of the market into which political forces should not be allowed. Yeah, so the, a lot of countries have done the things to uh, make that uh, possible the, in the last few decades. You know, a lot of countries have given political independence uh, to the central bank. Yeah? Because uh, the argument was, you know, if you let uh, politicians uh, dictate uh, how monetary policy can be uh, run, this uh, that, that irrational political that, that considerations will come into the 
uh, management of uh, monetary policy. The problem with this argument is that actually there is no such objective boundary around the market that you can draw. My view is that the freedom of the market is in the eyes of the beholder. There is no scientific way to say up to this uh, should be left to the logic of the market and beyond that you can have government intervention. Let me give you an example. Child labor. You know, in 1819, a bunch of uh, reformist MPs in the British Parliament tabled this uh, motion that was supposed to introduce this law to regulate child labor. And by today's standard, this was a joke. First of all, it was supposed to apply only to cotton textile. You know, there were millions of children working in coal mines and uh, uh, working as chimney sweep and other types of factories, but it was supposed to be only for the, the cotton factory because uh, this was uh, considered particularly dangerous uh, for children. At the time, the technology of uh, producing cotton textile produced a lot of dust. And this dust would uh, settle in the workers' lungs and cause disease. And a lot of uh, children died in the cotton the textile factories. Eh? So they said, OK, this is the worst case, uh, so we are going to regulate that. Eh? And then they said, of course, uh, we cannot ban all child labor. Eh? So we are going to regulate it. So they said, uh, very young children shouldn't work under the age of nine. Between nine and 16, they could work, but only reduced hours. How many? 12. Mm -hmm. This is a time when adult workers were working 15, 16 hours a day. So 12 hours was uh, considered uh, light. Yeah? But even then, a lot of people were up in arms. Yeah? Parliamentarians, that, uh, economists, that, uh, land, that factory owners. And the strongest argument was this leg regulation fundamentally goes against the foundation of the free market economy, namely the freedom of contract. Yeah? You know, these children want to work. Actually, they need to work. These people want to employ them. What is your problem? Yeah? Well, fast forward uh, two centuries. Today, no politician, no economist, at least in the rich countries, say we need to bring back child labor in order to truly make our labor market free. In many developing countries, where unfortunately there is a still widespread child labor, in many developing countries, 40 to 50% of the population is children, because they had recently very fast population growth. It's the biggest possible regulation that you can think of. You are basically, potentially, pushing half the labor force out of the labor market. No one sees it that way these days because we have accepted this uh, different value. Eh? So that's why I said that like beauty, freedom of the market is in the eyes of the beholder. Eh? And one person could say, wow, that's a free market. Eh? Another might say, well, the, the, what are you talking about? This is uh, the most highly regulated market I've ever seen. Eh? You know, George W. Bush, uh, in his uh, typical idiot savant way, put this uh, point across beautifully. When he was announcing the $700 billion bailout package for American banks following the 2008 financial crisis, he argued that what he was doing was the continuation of the American system of free enterprise, which rests on the conviction that the federal government should intervene only when necessary. But who decides when it is necessary? What economic theory do you use? Yeah? So in this vein, I would argue that defining the free market is at the deepest level a pointless exercise because there is no such thing as a free market. Yeah? All markets are constrained by institutions that determine who can participate, what can be exchanged, what are the rights and obligations of people who are involved in the process, how to run the exchange process, and so on. And all of these have underlying 
political and even ethical assumptions. Eh? Now, if you ask uh, free market economists, do you really think uh, there are, in reality, this uh, textbook style free markets in existence? They'll probably say, well, I mean, that's not ideal, but there's uh, the one market that comes pretty close to it, which is the stock market. Eh? You know, instantaneous price adjustment, a very rapid spread of information. But does this mean that I can turn up at the doorstep of London Stock Exchange tomorrow morning with a bag full of the shares of my company and sell them? No. Why? Because I have to get listed. Yeah? Okay, having been told that I have to list my company, I come back home and I call the London Stock Exchange and uh, the ask someone to list my company. Can I do it? No. Because uh, you need the vetting process. Yeah? Uh, depending on the country, depending on the exchange, you might have to the, the, the produce huge amount of documentation, at least about the, the last uh, three to five years of your activities, and they'll the, the check whether you are worthy of uh, listing. Okay, so the, I go through this uh, process, and then does it mean that I can then the, go to London Stock Exchange and sell my shares? No, because you have to be a licensed uh, the broker and trader to do that. Yeah? I cannot sell the, those uh, shares myself. Hmm? You know, right after the eruption of the 2008 financial crisis, many countries shut down their stock market. Hmm? It's known as holidays. Yeah? Basically, to calm the nerves, hmm? they shut down these uh, markets. So even in the stock market, there are so many regulations telling you what you can do, what you cannot do, who can do it, who cannot do it. Yeah? And when it comes to other markets, there are even more yeah, restrictions because uh, this is uh, one of the freest markets. Yeah? So in many countries, you are not allowed to trade in you know, addictive drugs or human organs or human beings. Yeah, yeah but when you think about it, uh, why not? You know, I'm told that uh, in Iran that uh, you can sell your kidney legally. Yeah? Until the 1960s and 70s, in most countries, you could pattern a drug invented by someone else as far as uh, you make it through a different process. Yeah? So traditionally, in chemical and pharmaceutical industries, there were these uh, no two notions of patterns. One is product pattern, so invention of a chemical substance that can act on certain diseases, and the process pattern. Yeah? having identified the, uh, the chemical, how you make it. Yeah? And most countries actually gave only process pattern because the reasoning was that, well, we cannot give you product pattern because this chemical has always existed in nature, yeah? which is why countries like India, Brazil, and Thailand could uh, produce these uh, copy drugs uh, that, uh, with impunity because you know, as far as you make it uh, through a different chemical process, you could do it. Mm -hmm. How you deal with uh, fraud, how you deal with bankruptcy, you know, if uh, some company that has been supplying you goes bankrupt, you know, how do you get compensation? You know, there's a huge range of issues that need legal regulation. And all of these uh, the regulations are based on some notions of justice, some notions of what is that, that, that uh, someone's uh, right and uh, uh, someone's uh, obligation. And basically the conclusion is that we think a market is free only because we so totally accept the underlying political and even ethical assumptions that create this uh, the body of regulations that define that market that we stop seeing them. Yeah? Uh, there, there are these people, some libertarian economists, who make a case for uh, slavery. We all own ourselves. And if uh, it's a voluntary agreement that uh, you sell yourself as a slave to someone, that's OK. Yeah? yeah, I mean, is there any economic reason why that uh, shouldn't be the case? Well, of course, that uh, most people uh, find this uh, idea absurd because they implicitly understand that people will sell, uh, uh, give up their freedom and sell themselves uh, only, uh, as a slave only when they have no other alternative. Yeah? So basically what I'm trying to say is that the uh, market itself is a political construct. Yeah? It is based on a host of regulations 
that embody political and sometimes even ethical values. And for that reason, it is an illusion to think that economies can be politics free. Because the ultimate economic category for people who believe that, i.e. the market, is actually politically constructed. You know, economics is a wonderful subject. Pretending that it's a science of everything, you know, that you can explain everything from you know, income inequality to climate change to Japanese sumo wrestlers you know, and Chicago drug dealers, that's when you have a problem. You know?